A Woman in Berlin Diary, 20th of April, 1945 to 22nd of June, 1945 By Anonymous Read by Diana Bishop Introduction by Anthony Beaver Afterward by Hans Magnus Ensenberger Translated from the German by Philip Bohm Introduction in the early hours of the 16th of April, 1945, civilians in the eastern quarters of Berlin were awoken by a distant rolling thunder. The vibrations were so strong that telephones began to ring on their own, and pictures fell from their hooks. Women emerged slowly from their apartments and exchanged meaningful looks with neighbours. They hardly needed to speak. The long-awaited Soviet offensive had at last begun, sixty miles to their east. One and a half million Red Army soldiers of Marshal Zhukov's First Belarusian Front were bursting out from the bridgeheads on the west bank of the River Oder. Facing them were the desperate scrapings of the embattled Third Reich, mainly boys from the Hitler Youth, old men from the Volkssturm, groups of cadets from Luftwaffe military schools and a stiffening of veterans and SS. They had little ammunition, hardly any shells for their artillery, and insufficient fuel for their few remaining armoured vehicles. Yet Goebbels, the Reich Commissar for the Defence of Berlin, as well as Minister of Propaganda, had declared that the line of the Oder was a wall on which the Asiatic hordes would smash themselves. Surrender was out of the question. Himmler had just issued orders that any German male found in a house displaying a white flag be shot. The Propaganda Ministry organised graffiti squads dressed as ordinary Germans, to paint slogans such as We will never surrender and protect our women and children from the red beasts. The argument for fighting on was largely based on Goebbels' own horror propaganda of enemy atrocities, which for once turned out to be no exaggeration. In the autumn of 1944, Soviet troops had made their first foray into East Prussia, laying waste to the village of Nemesdorf before being repulsed by a German counterattack. Goebbels had rushed forward camera teams to film the corpses of women and girls who had been raped and murdered by drunken Red Army soldiers. The images on the Nazi newsreels had been so appalling that many women presumed they were part of a gross exaggeration by the Promi, the propaganda ministry. But then in late January and early February, after the main Soviet assault on East Prussia and Silesia, refugees passing through Berlin recounted stories of rape, looting and murder on a terrifying scale. Yet many Berlin women, while certain that such things happened in the countryside and isolated communities, refused to believe that mass rape was possible in the public view of a capital city. Others, increasingly nervous, began rapidly to instruct young daughters in the facts of life, just in case the worst happened. Berlin, at the time, contained just over two million civilians, of whom the large majority were women and children. It was typical of the crazed irresponsibility of the Nazi regime at this time that Hitler rejected any idea of evacuating them while there was still time. He openly disbelieved the military commander of Berlin who told him that there were 120,000 babies and infants left in the city and no provisions for a supply of milk. Consciously or unconsciously, Hitler appears to have imitated Stalin's refusal to allow the evacuation of civilians from Stalingrad in order to force his troops to defend the city more bravely. This diary, written by a 34-year-old journalist, begins on Friday the 20th of April, four days after the opening of bombardment. It was Hitler's birthday. Nazi flags were raised over ruined edifices in the centre of the city, where US Air Force flying fortresses by day and RAF Lancasters by night had destroyed 90% of the buildings. Signs erected in Hitler's honour proclaimed, The fighting city of Berlin greets the Fuhrer. Even Hitler's military staff had no idea how close the fighting was. Soviet tank armies had now smashed their way through the German defences and were starting to encircle the city. The first shells from long-range artillery would land in the city's northern suburbs that evening. The diary, which filled two exercise books and a cloth-bound notebook, continues for just over two months, until the 22nd of June. This period covers the bombardment, the brief street fighting in most districts, Hitler's suicide on the 30th of April, the surrender of the last pockets of resistance on the 2nd of May, and then the occupation of the city by the conquerors. 
This diary was first published anonymously in 1954 in an English translation in the United States and in Britain in 1955 by Secker and Warburg. A German language edition followed five years later in Geneva and was highly controversial in Germany. Some accused it of besmirching the honour of German women. Rape and sexual collaboration for survival were taboo subjects in that post-war period, when men firmly reasserted their authority. In 2003, a woman in Berlin was republished in a new edition in Germany by Hans Magnus Enzenberger, one of Germany's most distinguished men of letters. In his De Andere Bibliothek series for Eichborn, and who adds the afterword to this edition. It subsequently emerged that the decision to republish followed the death of the anonymous author in June 2001 at the age of 90. She had not wanted another edition during her lifetime, after the storm it had provoked. A few months after its republication, however, Jens Biski, a prominent journalist and critic, claimed that he had discovered the identity of the anonymous diarist and named her as Marta Hiller. Ensenberger was furious and accused Biski of scandal journalismus. Though other journalists agree with Biski and feel certain that Marta Hiller is the author, the only person to know for sure is Hannelore Marek, literary executor of the estate, who has at no point confirmed it. Biski also cast certain doubts over the authenticity of the work, but Walter Kempowski, one of the most experienced editors of personal documents from the period, testified that he had examined all the original documents and the first typescript and was convinced that they were completely genuine. It was perhaps inevitable that doubts would be raised about this book, especially after the scandal over the fake Hitler diaries, and the great bestseller of the 1950s Last Letters from Stalingrad was found to be fictitious over forty years after its first appearance. On reading the earlier edition of this diary for the first time in 1999, I instinctively compared my reactions to the Stalingrad letters, which I had read five years before. I had become uneasy about the supposed Stalingrad letters quite quickly. They were too good to be true. One, for example, milked the emotions with a letter about a German concert pianist in Stalingrad whose fingers had been broken. As soon as I was able to compare the published collection with genuine last letters from Stalingrad in the German and Russian archives, I was certain that they were false. Yet any suspicions I felt obliged to raise about a woman in Berlin were soon discarded. The truth lay in the mass of closely observed detail. The then anonymous diarist possessed an eye which was so consistent and original that even the most imaginative novelist would never have been able to reproduce her vision of events. Just as importantly, other accounts, both written and oral, which I accumulated during my own research into the events in Berlin, certainly seem to indicate that there were no false notes. Of course, it is possible that some rewriting took place after the event, but that is true of almost every published diary. One of the reasons for questioning the diary's authenticity is its literary merit. The images are often striking. For example, the author describes young soldiers wearing their cartridge belts like some barbaric adornment. One might even suspect the felicity of its construction. All the main themes of the book are evoked in the first entry for the 20th of April. The civilians trapped in Berlin are deprived of meaningful news, yet they know that information on the Western Front where the Americans have just reached the line of the Elbe, is by then irrelevant. Our fate is rolling in from the east, she writes. It will transform the climate like another ice age. Yet no one uses the word Russians anymore. It refuses to pass our lips. She also notes that attitudes towards possessions have completely changed. People no longer distinguish clearly between their own property and that of others. She finds a love letter written to a previous tenant. A passionate love letter, which I flushed down the toilet. Most of the time we still have water. Heart, hurt, love, desire. How foreign, how distant these words sound now. Evidently a sophisticated, discriminating love life requires three square meals a day. My sole concern, as I write these lines, is my stomach. All thinking and feeling, all wishes and hopes begin with food. In the queue at the bakery that morning, she had heard rumours of the Red Army reducing the population of Silesia to starvation. 
She also realises that the lack of electricity and gas has reduced modern conveniences from lights, cookers and hot water boilers to useless objects. At this moment we are marching backwards in time. Cave dwellers. Soon they are all looting stores and shops as the imminent Soviet onslaught and collapse of Nazi power leaves society disintegrating into communities based on each building. The author's character comes through clearly in her writing. In contrast to the totally closed mind of Nazi Gleichschaltung, she was liberal and open-minded. She disliked the mindless xenophobia of the regime as much as its military machismo. In her twenties, she had travelled around Europe and had even visited the Soviet Union, where she picked up a basic knowledge of Russian. This was to prove vital once the Red Army arrived. Everyone in the apartment building came to her, expecting to be saved from the depredations of usually drunken soldiers. This put her in the front line. Apart from the bravery and resilience, she demonstrated, her account reveals the close relationship between an inquiring mind and intellectual honesty. It is this quality which makes the diary so impressive and so important. The author is a brilliant observer of her fellow members of the basement clan, the strange community transferred from life above ground in their apartments to a troglodyte existence in their communal air raid shelter. They have buckets and every other form of receptacle filled with water ready to put out a fire, yet if the building above them were to burn, such precautions would make little difference. But the biggest fear is what will happen when the Russians arrive. One young man in grey trousers and horn-rimmed glasses turned out on closer inspection to be a woman, hoping to save herself from the attention of Red Army soldiers. Other young women try to make themselves appear old and dirty in the vain hope of repelling lust. Still, the black humour of Berliners resurfaces from time to time. Before Christmas they had joked about that season's presence. Give something useful. Give a coffin. The other witticism, soon out of date as the Soviet armies surrounded Berlin, was that optimists were learning English and pessimists learning Russian. Deference to the Nazi regime collapses along with an administration that can no longer protect its subjects. Ration cards may still be stamped, but only out of bureaucratic habit. Although a few diehards proclaim their confidence in Hitler, even they no longer speak of the Führer anymore. They refer simply to he and him. The propaganda ministry's promises of victory and a bright future fool nobody, yet many still suffer from that powerful human desire for hope in the face of all logic. The diarist is more realistic. She glimpses a few German soldiers. That was the first time I saw real front-line men all of them old. The carts were pulled by Polish ponies, dark-coated in the rain. The only other freight they're hauling is hay. Doesn't look much like a Blitzkrieg anymore. She is always intrigued by paradox. These are strange times, she writes. History experienced firsthand, the stuff for tales yet untold and songs unsung. But seen up close, history is vexing, nothing but burdens and fears. Tomorrow I'll go and look for nettles and get some coal. The only physical description of herself is a pale-faced blonde always dressed in the same winter coat. Yet she is meticulous in recording her feelings out of an almost forensic curiosity. I've had to cope with my fear of death. The symptoms are always the same. First the sweating beads up my hairline. Then I feel something boring into my spine. My throat gets scratchy. My mouth goes dry, my heart starts to skip. My eyes are fixed on the chair leg opposite, memorising every turned bulge and curve. It would be nice to be able to pray. Her reason for writing all this is quite simple. It does me good, takes my mind off things. She also thinks of showing her account to her erstwhile fiancé, Gerd, if he comes back. One of the most important aspects of this diary is the careful and honest reflections on rape in war. Just before the Red Army arrives, Frau W. jokes in the cellar, better a rusky on top than a yank overhead. The diarist looks around at the other women and girls, wondering who is a virgin and who is not. Soon afterwards, when somebody in the cellar ventures that perhaps the Red Army soldiers are not so bad after all, 
a refugee from East Prussia, screams, They'll find out all right. The cellar falls silent. They realise that the horrors she has witnessed, and probably experienced, were not just the ravings of the propaganda ministry. The diarist notes how their language has coarsened. The word shit rolls easily off the tongue. It's even said with satisfaction, as if by doing so we could expel our inner refuse. We debase our language in expectation of the impending humiliation. When the Red Army reaches their street on the 27th of April, they know that the moment of truth has arrived. My stomach was fluttering, she wrote after seeing her first Russians through the window. I felt the way I had as a schoolgirl just before a maths exam, anxious and uneasy, wishing that it was already over. At first, things do not appear too bad. The soldiers in the street are playing with bicycles they have found, trying to learn to ride them. She is asked if she has a husband. It becomes a constant refrain. If she says she has, they ask where he is. If she says no, they ask if she wants a Russian husband, followed by crude flirting. According to a pattern, which almost all first-hand accounts confirm, the soldier's first interest is in looting watches. Most have five or six strapped round each forearm. But once the evening came and they had drunk their ration of vodka, the hunting parties began. The diarist manages to save the baker's wife from rape in the cellar by fetching an officer who persuades them to leave. He evidently has little authority to prevent such acts, and immediately after his departure the diarist is seized by the same men. The whole subject of mass rape in war is hugely controversial. Some social historians argue that rape is a strategy of war, and that the act itself is one of violence, not sex. Neither of these theories are supported by events in Germany in 1945. There have indeed been cases of rape being used as a terror tactic in war. The Spanish Civil War and Bosnia are two clear examples. But no document from the Soviet archives indicates anything of the sort in 1945. Stalin was merely amused by the idea of Red Army soldiers having some fun after a hard war. Meanwhile, loyal communists and commissars were taken aback and embarrassed by the mass rapes. One commissar wrote that the Soviet propaganda of hatred had clearly not worked as intended. It should have instilled in Soviet soldiers a sense of disgust at the idea of having sex with a German woman. The argument that rape has more to do with violence than sex is a victim's definition of the crime, not a full explanation of male motive. Certainly the rapes committed in 1945 against old women, young women, even barely pubescent girls, were acts of violence, an expression of revenge and hatred. But not all of the soldiers' anger came in response to atrocities committed by the Wehrmacht and the SS in the Soviet Union. Many soldiers had been so humiliated by their own officers and commissars during the four years of war that they felt driven to expiate their bitterness, and German women presented the easiest target. Polish women and female slave labourers in Germany also suffered. More pertinent, Russian psychiatrists have written of the brutal barracks eroticism created by Stalinist sexual repression during the 1930s, which may also explain why Soviet soldiers seem to need to get drunk before attacking their victims. More important, by the time the Red Army reached Berlin, eyewitness accounts and reports show that revenge and indiscriminate violence were no longer the primary factors. Red Army soldiers selected their victims more carefully, shining torches in the faces of women in air raid shelters and cellars to find the most attractive. A third stage then developed, which the diarist also describes, where German women developed informal agreements with a particular soldier or officer who would protect them from other rapists and feed them in return for sexual compliance. A few of these relationships even developed into something deeper, much to the dismay of the Soviet authorities and the outrage of wives at home. For obvious reasons, it has never been possible to calculate the exact figure of the number of rape victims in 1945. A general estimate given is two million German women. This figure excludes Polish women and even Soviet women and girls brought to Germany for slave labour by the Wehrmacht. But the figures for Berlin are probably the most reliable in all of Germany, between 95,000 and 130,000, according to the two leading hospitals. 
These can hardly be inflated figures if one takes into account that at least a dozen women and girls were raped in the single medium-sized apartment block where the author lived. Some pockets in the city escaped completely, but not that many when one considers that over a million troops were either billeted in the city or passed through it. Most wanted what they saw as their share of loot, in one form or another. A number of victims, as the diary indicates, suffered grave psychological damage, but the author and the widow she comes to live with instinctively see the best means of self-preservation. Slowly but surely we're starting to view all the raping with a sense of humour, she writes. Gallows humour. The widow jokes to everyone they meet about the compliment she was paid by one rapist who declared that she was much better than any Ukrainian woman. The author's sense of humour is drier. She finally manages to wash her sheets. They needed it, she notes, after all those booted guests. Rape in war is a collective experience, she also observes, as opposed to in peacetime when it is individual. Each woman helps the other by speaking about it, airing her woes. But as she soon found out, the male half of the German population wanted the subject to be buried. These days I keep noticing how my feelings towards men are changing, she writes as Hitler's regime collapses. We feel sorry for them. They seem so miserable and powerless. The weaker sex. Deep down we women are experiencing a kind of collective disappointment. The Nazi world, ruled by men glorifying the strong man, is beginning to crumble, and with it the myth of man. That has transformed us, emboldened us. Among the many defeats at the end of this war is the defeat of the male sex. Her optimism proved sadly premature. The late 1940s and the 1950s, after the men returned from prison camps, were a sexually repressive era in which husbands reasserted their authority. Women were forbidden to mention the subject of rape, as if it somehow dishonoured their men, who were supposed to have defended them. It remained taboo until the late 1980s, when a younger generation of women started to encourage their mothers and grandmothers to speak about their experiences. A woman in Berlin is a war diary unlike any other. This is a victim's eye view, a woman's perspective of a terrifying onslaught on a civilian population. Yet her account is characterised by its courage, its stunning intellectual honesty, and its uncommon powers of observation and perception. This book is one of the most important personal accounts ever written about the effects of war and defeat. It is also one of the most revealing pieces of social history imaginable. Anthony Beaver, 2004 Translator's Note Local terrain familiar to the author is foreign to us. Streets and districts, outlying towns, and even the specific architecture of apartment buildings, which in Berlin are frequently built around a courtyard, with shops at street level below the residences. In conceiving this topography, I have tried to make it as accessible as possible while preserving a sense of place. Most names of places and streets have been kept in German. Munchenberg, Berliner Strasse. Although a few, Landwehr Canal, instead of Landwehr Canal, have been anglicised for clarity. The district Rathaus is identified once as a town hall and remains Rathaus. Most military terms have been rendered with the UK equivalent, sub-lieutenant, although some Nazi-era formations have been kept in German, Schutzpolizei, Volkssturm. Schnapps is a generic word for certain distilled spirits and has been variously translated as liquor, brandy or vodka, depending on the context. Russian words have been transliterated, with any necessary translations provided in the text. Philip Bohm this chronicle was begun on the day when Berlin first saw the face of war. Friday, 20th of April, 1945, 4 p.m. It's true, the war is rolling towards Berlin. What was yesterday a distant rumble has now become a constant roar. We breathe the din. Our ears are deafened to all but the heaviest guns. We've long given up trying to figure out where they're positioned. We're ringed in by barrels, and the circle is growing smaller by the hour. Now and then, whole hours pass in eerie silence. 
Then, all of a sudden, you remember that it's spring. Clouds of lilac perfume drift over from untended gardens and go wafting through the charred ruins of apartment houses. Outside the cinema, the acacia stump is foaming over with green. The gardeners must have snatched a few minutes between sirens to dig at their allotment plots, because there's freshly turned earth around the garden sheds up and down Berliner Strasse. Only the birds seem suspicious of this particular April. There's not a single sparrow nesting in the gutters of our roof. A little before three o'clock, the newspaper wagon drove up to the kiosk. Two dozen people were already waiting for the delivery man, who immediately vanished in a flurry of hands and coins. Gerda, the concierge's daughter, managed to grab a few evening editions and let me have one. It's not a real paper any more, just a kind of news sheet printed on two sides and damp on both. The first thing I read as I went on my way was the Wehrmacht report. New place names. Munkerberg. Zela, Buchholst. They sound awfully close, like from somewhere in the Brandenburg Mark. I barely glanced at the news from the Western Front. What does it matter to us now? Our fate is rolling in from the East, and it will transform the climate like another ice age. People ask why, tormenting themselves with pointless questions. But I just want to focus on today, the task at hand. Little groups milling around the kiosk, people with pasty faces, murmuring, Impossible. Who would have thought that it would come to this? There's not one of us here that didn't have at least a shred of hope. Nothing the likes of us can do about it. The talk turns to Western Germany. They've got it good. For them it's over and done with. No one uses the word Russians anymore. It refuses to pass our lips. Back in the attic apartment, I can't really call it a home, I no longer have a home. Not that the furnished room I was bombed out of was really mine, either. All the same, I'd filled it with six years of my life, with my books and pictures and the hundreds of things you accumulate along the way. My starfish from that last peacetime summer on Norderney. The Kilim Gerd brought me from Persia. My dented alarm clock. Photos, old letters, my zither. Coins from twelve different countries a piece of knitting that I'd started. All the souvenirs, the old skins and shells, the residue and warm debris of lived-in years. Now that it's gone and all I have is a small suitcase with a handful of clothes, I feel naked, weightless. Since I own nothing, I can lay claim to everything. This unfamiliar attic apartment, for instance. Well, it's not entirely unfamiliar. The owner is a former colleague, and I was a frequent guest before he was called up. In keeping with the times, we used to barter with each other. His canned meat from Denmark for my French cognac, my French soap for the stockings he had from Prague. After I was bombed out, I managed to get hold of him to tell him the news, and he said I could move in here. Last I heard, he was in Vienna with the Wehrmacht censorship unit. Where is he now? Not that attic apartments are much in demand these days. What's more, the roof leaks, as many as the tiles have been shattered or blown away. I keep wandering around these three rooms, but I can't find any peace. I have systematically searched every single cupboard and drawer for anything usable. In other words, something to eat, drink, or burn. Unfortunately, there isn't much. Frau Vies, who used to clean the place, must have beaten me to it. These days, everything is up for grabs. People no longer feel so closely tied to things. They no longer distinguish clearly between their own property and that of others. I found a letter wedged inside a drawer addressed to the real tenant. I felt ashamed for reading it, but I read it all the same. A passionate love letter, which I flushed down the toilet. Most of the time we still have water. Heart, hurt, love, desire. How foreign, how distant these words sound now. Evidently a sophisticated, discriminating love life requires three square meals a day. My sole concern as I write these lines is my stomach. All thinking and feeling, all wishes and hopes, begin with food. Two hours later. The gas is running on a tiny, dying flicker. The potatoes have been cooking for hours. The most miserable potatoes in the country. Only good for distilling into liquor, they turn to mush and taste like cardboard. 
I swallowed one half raw. I've been stuffing myself since early this morning. Went to Bollas to use up the pale blue milk coupons Gerd sent me for Christmas. Not a moment too soon. I got the last drops. The saleswoman had to tilt the can. She said there'd be no more milk coming into Berlin. That means children are going to die. I drank a little of the milk right there on the street. Then back at home I wolfed down some porridge and chased it with a crust of bread. In theory, I've eaten better than I have in ages. In practice, the hunger is gnawing away at me like a savage beast. Eating just made me hungrier than ever. I'm sure there's some scientific explanation. Something about food stimulating the digestive juices and making them crave more. No sooner do they get going than the limited supply is already digested, and they start to rumble. Rummaging through the few books owned by the tenant of this apartment, where I also found the blank notebook I'm using to write this, I turned up a novel. The setting is English aristocratic, with sentences like, She cast a fleeting glance at her untouched meal, then rose and left the table. Ten lines later I found myself magnetically drawn back to that sentence. I must have read it a dozen times before I caught myself scratching my nails across the print, as if the untouched meal, which had just been described in detail, was really there, and I could physically scrape it out of the book. A sure sign of insanity. Onset of mild delusions, brought on by lack of food. I'm sorry I don't have Hamson's hunger to read up on the subject. Of course I couldn't read it even if I hadn't been bombed out, since somebody snatched my copy right out of my shopping bag over two years ago in the U-barn. It had a raffia cover. Evidently the pickpocket mistook it for a ration card holder. Poor man. He must have been a very disappointed thief. I'm sure Hamson would enjoy hearing that story. Morning gossip at the baker's. When they get here, they'll go through the apartments and take whatever they can find to eat. Don't expect them to give us a thing. They've worked it all out. The Germans are going to have to starve for two months. People in Silesia are already running round the woods digging up roots. Children are dying. Old people are eating grass, like animals. So much for the Vox Populi. No one knows anything for sure. There's no Volkische Beobachter on the stairs anymore. No Frau Wiers coming up to read to me the headlines about rape over breakfast. Old woman of seventy defiled. None violated twenty-four times. I wonder who was counting. That's exactly what they sound like, too, those headlines. Are they supposed to spur the men of Berlin to protect and defend us women? Ridiculous. Their only effect is to send thousands more helpless women and children running out of town, jamming the roads heading west where they're likely to starve or die under fire from enemy planes. Whenever she read the paper, Fravier's eyes would get big and glaze over. Something in her actually enjoyed that brand of horror. Either that or her unconscious was just happy it hadn't happened to her. But she is afraid. I know for a fact she wanted to get away. I haven't seen her since the day before yesterday. Our radio's been dead for four days. Once again we see what a dubious blessing technology really is. Machines with no intrinsic value, worthless if you can't plug them in somewhere. Bread, however, is absolute. Coal is absolute. And gold is gold, whether you're in Rome, Peru or Breslau. But radios, gas stoves, central heating, hot plates, all these gifts of the modern age, they're nothing but dead weight if the power goes out. At the moment we're marching backwards in time. Cave dwellers. Friday, probably around 7pm. Went for one last quick ride on the tram headed for the Rathaus. The air is full of rolling and rumbling, the constant thunder of heavy guns. The tram conductress sounded pathetic, shouting over the din. I studied the other passengers. You could read in their faces what they weren't saying out loud. We've turned into a nation of mutes. People don't talk to one another except when they're safe in their basements. When's the next time I'll ride a tram? Will I ever? They've been pestering us with these Class 1 and Class 2 tickets for the past several weeks, and now the news sheet says that as of tomorrow, only people with the red Class 3 tickets will be allowed to use public transportation. That's about one in four hundred. In other words, no one, which means that's it. A cold evening, 
dry taps. My potatoes are still simmering on the tiny gas flame. I poked around and managed to fill some shopping bags with split peas, pearl barley, flour and ersatz coffee, then stashed the bags in a box. More luggage to drag down to the basement. After I'd tied it all up, I realised I'd forgotten the salt. The body can't do without salt, at least not for long. And we'll probably be holed up down there for a while. Friday, 11pm. By the light of an oil lamp in the basement, my notebook on my knees. Around 10pm there was a series of three or four bombs. The air raid siren started screaming. Apparently it has to be worked manually now. No light. Running downstairs in the dark, the way we've been doing ever since Tuesday, we slip and stumble. Somewhere a small hand-operated dynamo is whirring away. It casts giant shadows on the wall of the stairwell. Wind is blowing through the broken panes, rattling the blackout blinds. No one pulls them down anymore. What's the point? Shuffling feet. Suitcases banging into things. Lutz Lehman screaming, Mutti! To get to the basement shelter, we have to cross the street to the side entrance, climb down some stairs, then go along a corridor and across a square courtyard with stars overhead and aircraft buzzing like hornets. Then down some more stairs, through more doors and corridors. Finally, we're in our shelter, behind an iron door that weighs a hundred pounds, with rubber seals around the edges and two levers to lock it shut. The official term is air raid shelter. We call it cave, underworld, catacomb of fear, mass grave. The ceiling is supported by a forest of rough timbers. You can smell the resin despite the closeness of the air. Every evening, old Herr Schmidt, Curtainman Schmidt, launches into a structural analysis to demonstrate that the forest will hold up even if the building overhead collapses, assuming that it collapses at a certain angle and distributes its weight in a certain way. The landlord, who should know about that kind of thing, isn't around to tell us. He took off to Bad Ems and is now an American. In any case, the people here are convinced that their cave is one of the safest. There's nothing more alien than an unknown shelter. I've been coming here for nearly three months and still feel like a stranger. Every place has its own set of quirks and regulations. In my old basement, they were obsessed with having water on hand in case of fire. Wherever you turned, you bumped into pots and pails and buckets and barrels full of murky fluid. And still the building burned like a torch. You might as well have spit on the fire for all that water would have done. Frau Viers told me that, in her shelter, it's the lungs. At the first sound of a bomb, they all bend forward and take very shallow breaths, their hands pressed against their bodies. Someone told them that this would help prevent burst lungs. Here in this basement, they're all fixated on the walls. They sit with their backs against the outside wall, except in front of the ventilation flap. At the first explosion, they move on to the next obsession. Cloths. Everyone has a cloth handy to wrap around their mouths and noses and then tie behind their heads. I haven't seen that in any other basement. I don't know how the cloths are supposed to help. Still, if it makes people feel better. Apart from these ticks, it's the usual cave dwellers on the usual chairs, which range from kitchen stools to brocade armchairs. We're mostly upper and lower middle class, with a sprinkling of workers. I look around and take stock. First is the baker's wife, two plump red cheeks swaddled in a lambskin collar. Then the pharmacist's widow, who finished a training course in first aid and who sometimes lays out cards on two chairs pushed together and reads them for the other women. Frau Lehmann, whose husband is missing in the east and who is now a pillow for the sleeping infant on her arm and four-year-old Lutz asleep on her lap, his shoelaces dangling. The young man in grey trousers and horn-rimmed glasses, who on closer inspection turns out to be a young woman. Three elderly sisters, all dressmakers, huddled together like a big black pudding. The refugee girl from Königsberg in East Prussia, wearing the few old rags she's managed to piece together. Then there's Schmidt, who was bombed out and reassigned here. Schmidt, the curtain wholesaler without curtains, always chatting away despite his years. The book-selling husband and wife who spent several years in Paris and often speak French to each other in low voices. 
I'd just been listening to a woman of forty who was bombed out of her home in Adlershof and moved in here with her mother. Apparently a high-explosive bomb buried itself in her neighbour's garden and completely demolished her own house, which she had bought with her savings. The pig she'd been fattening up was flung all the way into the rafters. It wasn't fit to eat after that. The married couple next door to her also met their maker. People retrieved what parts of them they could from the rubble of the building and the mess in the garden. The funeral was very nice. An all-male choir from the Tailors' Guild sang at the graveside. But everything ended in confusion when the sirens cut in during the Rock of Ages and the gravediggers had to practically throw the coffin in the ground. You could hear the contents bumping about inside. And now for the punchline, the narrator chuckling in advance, although so far her story hasn't been all that funny. And imagine, three days later their daughter is going through the garden looking for anything of use, and right behind the rain barrel she stumbles on one of her papa's arms. A few people give a brief laugh, but most don't. I wonder, did they bury the arm as well? Continuing with my inventory. Across from me is an elderly gentleman, a businessman, wrapped in blankets and sweating feverishly. Next to him is his wife, who speaks with a sharp Hamburg S, and their eighteen-year-old daughter, whom they call Stinchen, with the same S. Then comes the blonde, who was recently reassigned here and whom no one knows, holding hands with her lodger, whom no one knows either. The scrawny retired postmaster and his wife, who is forever lugging around an artificial leg made of nickel, leather and wood. A partial pieta, since its owner, their one-legged son, is, or was, nobody knows for sure, in a military hospital in Breslau. The hunchbacked doctor of chemistry from the soft drink company slumped over in his armchair like a gnome. Then the concierge's family, a mother, two daughters, and a fatherless grandson. Erna and Henny from the bakery, who are staying with their employer because it was impossible for them to make their way home. Antoine the Belgian, with his curly black hair, who puts on a big show of being a baker's apprentice and has got something going with Henny. The landlord's housekeeper, who got left behind, and who, in open defiance of all air raid regulations, is carrying an ageing fox terrier. And then there's me, a pale-faced blonde, always dressed in the same winter coat, which I managed to save just by chance, who was employed in a publishing house until it shut down last week and sent its employers on leave until further notice. One or two other people, colourless, unremarkable, a community of discards, unwanted at the front, rejected by the Volkssturm, the civil defence. A few of our group are missing. The baker, who's gone out to his allotment plot to bury his silver. He's the only one in the building with a red Class three ticket. And Fräulein Bain, a brash spinster who works in the post office, who just raced off to get today's news sheet during a lull in the bombing. Another woman left for Potsdam to bury seven of her family who died in the heavy bombardment there. The engineer from the third floor is also absent, along with his wife and son. Last week he boarded a barge that was to take him and his household goods along the Mitterland Canal to Braunschweig, where his armaments factory has been moved. The entire workforce is heading for the centre of the country. It must be dangerously overpopulated, unless the Yanks have already arrived. We no longer know a thing. Midnight. No power. An oil lamp is smoking away on the beam above me. A sudden surge in the constant drone outside sets off our mania, and we all wrap our cloths around our mouths and noses. A ghostly Turkish harem. A gallery of half-bailed death masks. Only our eyes are alive. Saturday, 21st of April, 1945, 2 a.m. Bombs that made the walls shake. My fingers are still trembling as I hold my pen. I'm covered in sweat as if from hard labour. Before my building was hit, I used to go down to the shelter and eat thick slices of bread and butter. But since the night I helped dig out people who'd been buried in the rubble, I've been preoccupied forced to cope with my fear of death. The symptoms are always the same. First, the sweat beads up around my hairline. Then I feel something boring into my spine. My throat gets scratchy. 
My mouth goes dry, my heart starts to skip. I fixed my eyes on the chair leg opposite and am memorizing every turned bulge and curve. It would be nice to be able to pray. The brain clings to set phrases, fragments of sentences. Pass lightly through this world, for it is nothing. And each one falls as God desires. Nolitimere, and so on, until this wave of bombers passes. As if on command, everyone starts chattering feverishly, laughing, joking, shouting over one another. Fräulein Bain steps up with the news sheet and reads Goebbels' speech in honour of the Führer's birthday. The date had slipped most of our minds. She reads with a new intonation, a mocking, sarcastic voice we haven't heard down here before. Golden fields of grain, a people at peace. How about that, say the people from Berlin. That would be nice. High-blown phrases that now fall on deaf ears. Three in the morning. The basement is dozing away. Several all-clears sound, immediately followed by new alarms. No bombs, though. I'm writing. It does me good. Takes my mind off things. And Gerd needs to read this if he comes back. If he's still... No. Cross that out. I mustn't jinx things. The girl who looks like a young man just snuck up and asked what I'm writing. Nothing special. Just some private scribbling. Gives me something to do. After the earlier wave of bombs, Sigismund turned up, an elderly gentleman from the neighbourhood. His nickname comes from Sieg, Victory. He keeps talking about the victory at hand, the certain victory, Sieg this and Sieg that, which is presumably why he was kicked out of his own basement. Sigismund genuinely believes that salvation is at hand, and that that man, as we now call A.H., knows exactly what he's doing. Whenever he talks, the people sitting nearby exchange silent, meaningful glances. No one challenges Sigismund. Who wants to argue with a madman? Besides, madmen can be dangerous. The only person who agrees with him is the concierge's wife, and she is fervent in her support, pronouncing through her fang-like teeth that you can count on that man as if he were God himself. Nine in the morning, up in the attic apartment. I can only guess at these times. As long as there's no clock in sight, my life is timeless. Grey morning, pouring rain. I'm writing on the windowsill, using it as a standing desk. The all-clear sounded shortly after three. I came upstairs, took off my shoes, slipped out of my dress and collapsed onto my bed, which is always turned back and ready. Five hours of deep sleep. The gas is out. Just counted my cash. 452 marks. No idea what I'll do with all that money. The only things left to buy cost no more than a few pfennigs. I also have about a thousand in the bank, again because there's nothing to buy. When I opened that account in the first year of the war, I was still thinking of saving for peacetime, maybe even taking a trip around the world. That was a long, long time ago. Recently, people have been running to the bank, assuming they can find one that's still open, to withdraw their money. What for? If we go down, the mark goes with us. After all, money, at least paper money, is only a fiction and won't have any value if the central bank collapses. Indifferent, I run my thumb over the wad of bills, which probably won't be worth anything except souvenirs, snapshot of a bygone era. I assume the victors will bring their own currency, and let us have some. Or else they'll print some kind of military scrip, unless they decide not to give us even that and force us to work just for a helping of soup. Noontime. Endless rain. Walked to Parkstrasse and got some more paper money to add to my wad of souvenirs. The head clerk paid me last month's salary and made my vacation official. The whole publishing house has dissolved into thin air. The employment office has also breathed its last. No one is looking for help any more. So for the moment, we're all our own bosses. 
bureaucracy strikes me as a fair-weather friend. The whole civil service shuts down at the first sign of shrapnel. By the way, it's very peaceful just now. Alarmingly peaceful. We're no longer being governed. And still, everywhere you look, in every basement, some kind of order always emerges. When my house was hit, I saw how even people who'd been injured or traumatised or buried in the rubble walked away in an orderly manner. The forces of order prevail in this basement as well, a spirit that regulates, organises, commands. It has to be in our nature. People must have functioned that way as far back as the Stone Age. Herd instinct, a mechanism for preservation of the species. With animals, they say it's always the males, the lead bull, the lead stallion. But in our basement, lead mares would be closer to the truth. Fräulein Bain is a lead mare. So is the woman from Hamburg who keeps very calm. I'm not one, and I wasn't in my old basement either. Besides, back there we had a lead bull bellowing around, dominating the field, a retired major who brooked no rivals. I always hated having to huddle together down there, always tried to find a corner of my own to sleep in. But when the herd leader calls, I follow willingly. I walked alongside the tram. I couldn't get on since I don't have a Class 3 ticket, and it was nearly empty too. I counted eight passengers in the car. Meanwhile, hundreds of people were trudging right next to it in the pouring rain, even though the tram could easily have picked them up. It has to run anyway. But no. See above, under, order. It's rooted deep inside us. We do as we are told. I bought some rolls in the bakery. The shelves still appear to be stocked. You don't see any panic buying. After that, I went to the ration card office. Today they were stamping potato coupons, 75 to 77, for people with my last initial. The line went surprisingly quickly, although there were only two women on duty with rubber stamps instead of the usual group. They didn't even look at the coupons, just stamped them automatically like machines. Why all this stamping? No one knows. But we all go there, assuming that there's some sense in it. The last group, X to Z, is to report on the 28th of April, according to the posted schedule. Carts covered with sopping wet canvas were trundling through the rain into the city. Under the tarpaulins are soldiers. That was the first time I'd seen men from the real front line. Dirty, grey-bearded, all of them old. The carts were pulled by Polish ponies, dark-coated in the rain. The only other freight they're hauling is hay. Doesn't look much like a motorised blitzkrieg anymore. On the way home, I went behind the black ruins where Professor K used to live and broke into his abandoned garden, where I picked several crocuses and tore off some lilac branches. Took some to Frau Goltz, who used to live in my old apartment building. We sat across from each other at her copper table and talked. Or rather we shouted above the gunfire that had just resumed. Frau Goltz, her voice breaking, what flowers! What lovely flowers! The tears were running down her face. I felt terrible as well. Beauty hurts now. We're so full of death. This morning I wondered how many dead people I've seen in my life. The first was Herr Sherman. I was five at the time. He was seventy. Silver-white hair on white silk, candles at his head raised casket, the whole scene full of meaning. So death, then, was something solemn and beautiful. At least until 1928, when Hilda and Cutter P. showed me their brother Hans, who'd died the day before. He lay on the sofa like a bundle of rags, a blue scarf tied high round his chin, his knees bent. A piece of dirt and nothing. Later came my own dead relatives, blue fingernails among the flowers and rosaries, then the man in Paris who'd been run over and was lying in a pool of blood, and the frozen man on the Moskva River. Dead people, yes, but I've never seen anyone actually die. I expect that won't be long in coming. Not that I think it could happen to me. I've had so many narrow escapes, I feel I lead a charmed life. 
That's probably the way most people feel. How else could they be in such high spirits, surrounded by so much death? What's clear is that every threat to your life boosts your vitality. My own flame is stronger. I'm burning more fiercely than before the air raids. Each new day of life is a day of triumph. You've survived once again. You're defiant. On one hand, you stand taller, but at the same time your feet are planted more firmly on the ground. When the first bombs started to hit, I remembered a verse from Horace, which I penciled on the wall of my room. Si fractus illibatur orbis, impavidum ferient ruinae. Should nature's pillared frame give way, that wreck would strike one fearless head. Back then you could still write to people abroad. I quoted those lines in a letter to my friends the Dees in Stockholm, flexing my muscles, in part to make myself feel strong, by telling them how intense it was to live here amid all the danger. I felt a kind of forbearance writing that, as if I were an adult initiated into the deep secrets of life, speaking to innocent children in need of protection. Sunday, 22nd of April, 1945, 2 a.m. I was upstairs in bed, dozing away as the wind blew through the shattered panes. I had a brick at my feet that had taken hours to warm over a tiny gas flame. Around 8 p.m., Frau Lehmann knocked on the door. Come on down. The alarms are out. No sirens anymore. Everybody else is already in the basement. A breakneck rush down the stairs. I was scared to death when my heel got caught on the edge of a step. I barely managed to grab hold of the railing in time. My knees went weak, but I went on, heart pounding, slowly groping my way through the pitch-dark passage. Finally, I found the lever to the basement door. Our cave looked different. Everybody was bedded down. There were pillows everywhere, eiderdowns, deck chairs. I just managed to squeeze my way to my usual spot. The radio's dead. No signal, not even from the airport. The kerosene lantern is flickering dimly. A cluster of bombs, then things go quiet. Sigismund shows up, still waving his flag, claiming that the tide's about to turn. Even as Curtinman Schmidt is muttering something about Russians in Berno and Zossen. We stay put. The hours crawl by. We listen to the artillery thudding away, sometimes far off, sometimes quite close. The pharmacist's widow turns to me. You'd better not go back to that fourth-floor apartment of yours, she warns. She offers to let me spend the night in her apartment on the first floor. We clamber up the back stairs, formerly designated for servants and deliveries, a narrow spiral staircase. The glass shards crunch underfoot, wind whistles through the open windows. She shows me to a small room next to the kitchen. A couch by the door welcomes me in and grants me two hours of sleep under an unfamiliar smelling woolen blanket. Until sometime around midnight, when bombs start hitting nearby and we take refuge back in the basement. Long, miserable hours in the middle of the night, Right now, I'm too tired to go on writing down here. Next morning, a little before 10 a.m., upstairs in the attic apartment. We stuck it out in the basement until about 4 a.m. Then I climbed up here, warmed some turnip soup on what gas there was, peeled a couple of potatoes, boiled my last egg, it was practically liquid when I ate it, and dabbed on the last drops of cologne. It's strange to be doing all these things for the last time, at least for the foreseeable future, until further notice, for what's sure to be a long time. Where am I supposed to come up with another egg? Or more perfume? I treat myself to these pleasures deliberately, consciously, reverently. After that I crawled into bed with all my clothes on, slept in fits and starts, uneasy dreams. Now I have to run, do shopping. Back in the attic, 2 p.m. Torrents of rain outside. No more newspapers. Even so, people queued up right on time at the distribution centre. Apparently some leaflet or extra edition had run an announcement. News is now spread by word of mouth, and every new item gets quickly passed around. 
they're handing out what are officially called advance rations. Meat, sausage, processed foods, sugar, canned goods, and ersatz coffee. I took my place in line and waited.